Thanks for staying with us. Uh, Singa Kelly Kumala's name has been mentioned uh, a few times in the Senzo Meiwa murder trial. Now, the confessions, which were also admitted into evidence after a marathon trial within a trial, allege that the accused uh, were paid by Kumalo to take part in the murder. And this has raised a whole lot of questions. I'm sure you've also seen them in the public domain. So let's try to get some answers of how the law actually works here and speak to Dubazana attorneys and Tabi Singh. Dubazana Tabi Singh, thank you so much for your time this evening. I'm sure you're anticipating quite a lot of questions, but the first one, a lot of the viewers have been saying, given the fact that these confessions now form part of the record and Kelly Kumalo's name has been mentioned several times as well, they're asking, why is she not in the dock? Is there anything barring her from being in the dock currently? If we look back to the matter before it was heard de novo, which is what we are dealing with currently, if you recall, Advocate Mshololo in the first trial had actually inquired on this when the second docket was actually um, handed in in the middle of trial. And she was asking, why is it that we're only getting more evidence when the trial has already started and evidence that we deem to be quite important to the matter? And then a letter was written to the DPP to get clarity on this aspect. The DPP eventually wrote back. And when it wrote back, it said that, um, we will make a decision on what to do with docket number two after the conclusion of docket number one, which in our space, in the criminal space, criminal law space, I beg your pardon, it, it was shocking because it's not the first time that a matter is investigated by two different jurisdictions pertaining to one matter. Once the, the one um, party or the one jurisdiction gets wind of the fact that there is a matter that is being investigated. What they do is that they have a reconciliation. In other words, they get the matters to be made into one. So they don't lose the individual, what we call CAS number, which is attached to the actual docket, but the one that's already in the court roll will then basically absorb the other one and then they share the, the new case number within the court role. That's how it ought to have been done, especially when the matter started de novo, but that's not what happened. So it sounds like uh, you're hinting that maybe the process wasn't handled correctly from the beginning. Fully, fully so. It was not handled correctly from the beginning. It, it, and the other thing that doesn't make any sense in terms of jurisdiction and all of the likes, the one that we are currently hearing was being investigated within the Pretoria um, jurisdiction, right? And then the other one was being investigated within the Fosloras jurisdiction. So even if we were to say one was in Johannesburg, one was in Pretoria, Remember that the Johannesburg High Court and the Pretoria High Court share concurrent jurisdiction. So it wouldn't have been a train smash in any matter if one matter was transferred from Pretoria to Johannesburg and one from Johannesburg to Pretoria. Because at the end of the day, even when bail application is conducted in the Foslo Ras uh, Court for argument's sake, if the matter was enrolled in the first place, if it was enrolled in the Foslo Ras Match Court, a bail application would have been conducted there, but the matter was not going to be heard in the match court. It was going to be transferred to the high court in any event. So it would have been a situation to say that once bail application for the accused persons in docket number two has concluded, then perhaps the two matters can be reconciled and then the matter can proceed accordingly. And that was a bit of a problem. I don't know why, but it never happened. And if you recall in the... Uh, um, first trial before the one that we are dealing with right now, there was also a junior advocate who had written a letter to the DPP on the docket number two, i.e. the Fosloras matter, wherein that junior advocate had said, based on the evidence that was collected in that particular docket, there is a prima facie case to proceed against the seven accused persons in the Fosloras um, docket. So as to why that was not followed, it, we don't know. So what happens now then, um, you know, by law, are they supposed to call the people in the house to be putting them in the dock or can the person whose name has been mentioned, um, you know, be seen, be called either by the, the defense? Uh, what happens? What is the rightful process around um, Kelly Kumala and the evidence, uh, in fact, the allegations that have been made thus far? 
I wish I could give you a straight answer. It is murky and new territory in criminal space, so we don't have a clear answer. Had the process been followed from the beginning, we would not be having this conversation right now. But unfortunately, the process was not followed. So as a result, now the question is, what will happen? The accused person in the document is not before this court has been mentioned. What is the state going to do? Is the state going to stand by its averments or its, its statement in the DPP's letter that was sent in the first trial to say they will await the outcome of this matter and then make a decision on whether or not to charge the accused persons in docket number two, or will the accused, but the accused persons unfortunately can't be added at this particular stage. The matter is already part heard. Then there would have to be a situation where the accused um, from docket number two, let's say for argument's sake, the state has to add them. We would be looking at a trial de novo yet again because the evidence that the accused persons in docket number two have missed up until this date would have to be put to them as well. So they can't be added in this particular matter. So we just have to wait and see how it is that the state chooses to deal with this matter going forward. So as murky and as new territory it is then for the criminal justice system, it could be precedent setting, I suppose? It is 100% precedent setting because it's a high court matter. So us as criminal defense attorneys are sitting there smiling, going, oh, so I can use this going forward until there's an appeal that is um, going to change whatever the outcome of this is going to be. And from where I stand, I foresee this to be a, a guilty sentence, um, a, a judgment, I beg your pardon, based on the way in which the presiding officer is choosing to conduct this matter. I, for one, do not agree with a number of things that he does. I don't agree in the manner in which he deals with evidence. I don't agree in the manner in which when um, objections are raised on procedure, he accepts that procedure can be bent to a certain extent and not follow the letter of the law. But when it is brought up in a manner that puts him in uh, a dark corner, for lack of a better term, only then does he recall that procedure ought to be done this way. So from a defense attorney point of view, it seems like the 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 presiding officer is behaving as a prosecutor instead of being objective in this matter. The, a number of um, uh, evidence breaking admissions that he has done so far, inclusive in my humble opinion, of course, of this um, confession that has been admitted. Too many flaws were noted in the trial within a trial, but we all expected him to accept it, accept it based on the way that he's run the trial so far. Sure. saying it sounds like it's a long road ahead, um, you know, for this yes. particular battle. So thank you so much for at least helping us understand of, uh, you know, just this process that's unfolding before our eyes. And as you say, murky waters and new territory for the criminal justice system. So let's see how it fares then, um, you know, especially when it comes to this one. And I'm sure the defense is waiting with bated breath, uh, especially when it comes to their strategy. So let's see what happens. Uh, that's uh, Ntabiseng Tubazana there, uh, Tubazana with the Tubazana attorneys.